I guess everyone who's going to be here is pretty much here. So what are we going to do in this presentation and what are you going to hear here? We're going to try to answer the question, is GraalVM the holy grail of language interop? So first of all, what is language interoperability? And I will refer it as to uh, interop because that's just way easier to say. Uh, language interoperability is the capability of two different languages to interact natively as part of the same system. So what we did, we reached the research GraalVM uh, for interoperability interop between uh, Java and Node.js. So, the agenda for this talk is, first of all, we'll get to know the components responsible for this, that is Graal, uh, Truffle, and GraalVM. And then we'll look at some uh, interop, basic interop examples, and then we'll try to use a synchronous, uh, like a blocking Java library from Node, and then an asynchronous library from Node. And then we'll look at how we could use this in the real world and how would that look like. So, what is Graal? Uh, Graal is a just in time compiler. Uh, recently, uh, a new interface has been implemented. Well, a, exposed in the JVM that allows you to plug in different JIT compilers into your JVM. So Graal is such a compiler uh, and uh, yeah, it implements that JVM compiler interface. N the next component that we'll be talking about is Truffle or Truffle. I guess Truffle is the correct way to say it. And uh, it's a framework for defining abstract syntax trees for other languages and the nice thing about it is that when you define your abstract syntax tree uh, for a language, uh, there's integration with Graal which allows it to be uh, just in time compiled and uh, executed with uh, really good performance characteristics. And GraalVM is just a distribution uh, which contains a, a JDK, the Graal just in time compiler, so the, J the JDK with the Graal compiler inside of it, the truffle libraries and the binaries for Ruby and Node.js. So just a binary called Ruby and a binary called Node, which you can use. So how does this work in general? So when you're writing your Java, what happens in the JVM is you write your source, uh, source code in Java, you run it through Java C to compile it into class files which contain the bytecode, which is then loaded into the JVM and just in time compiled into native code which is actually executed by your processor. Where Graal comes in, uh, it plugs in into this uh, pipeline uh, and uh, the JVM gives the bytecode to Graal, it transforms it into some uh, internal structure which is a graph and uh, then Graal actually emits the native code that the JVM later on runs. Uh, the nice part about this and where Truffle comes in is that with Truffle your, let's say, Java files uh, are converted to the Truffle uh, syntax trees, uh, like to, to, to abstract syntax trees and then uh, instead of going to bytecode they are directly transformed into these executable graphs in, gra in Graal which it can then uh, optimize and uh, execute really fast. So, how do we use a JVM library in Node.js? Well, there's uh, documentation and uh, the slides will be available somewhere, I assume, so you can just go to these links and read a, a bit about it. Uh, we won't uh, s spend too much time on this, but the TLDR of this is that uh, with uh, GraalVM, uh, Inside of the Graal VM, you get a node executable, which is a drop-in replacement for Node.js, and it's mostly compatible with existing libraries, and you enable JVM interoperability uh, by starting the node uh, binary with a dash dash JVM uh, flag. The really amazing thing about this whole thing is that most cross-language calls do not need conversions at runtime at all. So if you have a Java string and you give it to a JavaScript uh, function or 
vice versa. There's no copying of uh, like the whole string. You just pass a pointer around, so it's like it's referring to the same object in the heap, which is uh, well, which is what makes this special. So, if we want to use this, how do we do that? So, when you run the uh, node uh, node binary with a dash dash JVM uh, flag, you get a object called Java on the global scope. And in this really simple example, what we do, we first of all uh, get a reference to the Java lang system class, and uh, uh, then we can actually just uh, access static, well in this case we can access static member on the system class which is out, which is the output stream, and then we can call the method on that output stream which is print line, hello world. And uh, so we would run it with uh, this line and it would actually print hello world. I mean this is uh, nice but it's nothing too special, I mean we could just console log this. So, but we'll later on see some more interesting examples. So, our first use case we'll try to do some synchronous in interop. By synchronous I mean blocking, whatever you want to call it. So, we'll uh, try to use bcrypt, uh, and bcrypt is uh, a CPU intensive hashing function, that's kind of the, the whole point of bcrypt is that it's hard to compute. Uh, and the goal of this exercise, this use case will be we want to use the JVM bcrypt library called jbcrypt from Node.js. So, of course, there's uh, perfectly fine uh, bcrypt libraries for Node.js natively, but this is just so we can see how it works. And then we'll try to integrate it into our server to handle user logins, and we'll see how that works. So the plan. First of all, we'll need to somehow tell the JVM where to find the jar, because, well, like when you're running this, Node.js uh, binary with uh, the dash dash JVM uh, flag, there still has to be a JVM somewhere and it can't just magically find the jar. Uh, then we'll see how we just, how we can call this, uh, call the functions in the library from Node, then we'll integrate it into our application and if all goes well, we'll get to go, go home early because we just re-implemented a huge chunk of code that we don't need to re-implement again in Node or C or whatever. So, how do we tell the JVM where to find the jar? Um, there's two main options. So, one option, when you're just starting your Node uh, binary, you can provide a dash dash vm dot cp uh, argument with the, the regular JVM class path, or you can dynamically add uh, things to the class path using uh, the method add to class path on the uh, Java object. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at this point, uh, if we wanted to provide, let's say, well, somehow provide this, uh, you know, bcrypt library wrapped uh, to like other GraalJS programs, uh, we will run into an issue because if we just blindly package a jar with an NPM module, uh, well, there's a bit of a conflict here because NPM, for NPM it's completely fine to have multiple copies of the same library in your node modules. Uh, if you have multiple copies of the same jar in your uh, uh, class path, it's, you'll get the first one there, or the last one, I don't remember which one, but it's, it is a bit of an issue. Uh, but we'll just ignore that for now, and uh, what we'll do, we'll just manually specify the class path with the first option. Uh, so how, do, how does that look? Well, very similar actually to what we did with uh, uh, system out. Uh, so we need to get a reference to the bcrypt class, which we do with a Java type. We need to have a salt. Ignore that, don't read it, but it just has to be a specific format. And then it's a really nice uh, API because it's just a static method on the, this bcrypt class, hash password where we give the password we want to hash and the salt we want uh, and the salt and we get the hash back and then we just print it out. So if we ran this, well the, fortunately at this point the flags are growing a bit and getting a bit longer, 
but if we ran it, it would print the hash, and uh, that's pretty much it, actually. And actually, to use it in our application, well, we can just implement a simple uh, route, express route that handles logins, and we just give it in a like, query parameter and respond with a hashed password. It's like not how you would <laughs> do logins, but it's just for the sake of the of an example. So let's see how that would actually look. So let's start the server. Uh, one thing you'll notice here probably, I should use this brick to get a drink of water, is that it's much slower than your usual node. Well, yeah, now it's listening on uh, for requests. And the reason it's slower, well, I mean, it has to actually start the JVM. So it's quite a bit more work. So now we can see if it actually works at all. So what we have, we have, uh, yeah, it works. It serves the, like, index, uh, the index controller works. It just returns welcome, and we can actually try to, uh, to log in. And that works too. We actually get a hash back. I won't even try to guess if that's correct, but we can see that it actually it changes if we give it a different password, so that should be fine. Great. So that was uh, really simple. So can we ship it now? Well, uh, let's dig a little deeper here. So I have some scripts set up here. So let's first of all try to see, well, how, how good is it at serv serving requests? So we'll be just benchmarking the index controller that just returns welcome. If we start that, what we see is that we're getting not exactly the numbers you would expect to get with the native node. And it's like 300 requests per second, 200 requests per second, which is definitely not what you would expect. However, um, and the thing here to realize is, and uh, what they co continuously uh, repeat when talking about performance and benchmarks, is that you need to allow the JVM to warm up. And now it actually warmed up, and now we get like uh, 5,000 requests per second. So, and it, it did take quite some time to warm up. Uh, and actually, it's still lower than what you would get if you were, were just running node natively, but I mean, it's still probably good enough. So, okay, that's uh, fine, but let's, let's imagine that now we have a bunch of users coming into our site, you know, getting this uh, index HTML, whatever, the, the welcome response, and uh, we have uh, just one user who is logging in every second. So we can see that the request per second, well, dropped a tiny bit, but it's probably fine. Well, what if that user tries to log in every 0.1 second? So it just sends the request, gets the response, then sleeps for the number of seconds I put in here, and uh, so on. So if we try to do it every 0.1 seconds, now we see that it's, we've taken a significant hit to our request per second, and if it just doesn't wait at all and just does request back to back, but still, like at every one point, there's only one logging request being processed. Like we get, we we, we really lo lose our <laughs> performance here. So, uh, well, can anyone tell me what happened here? Just any get yeses? Exactly, we blocked the event loop. Uh, well, the good news is, like that, that's. You know, if you're doing node, you know that if you block the event loop, you're going to have a bad time. So now with uh, node uh, 10, uh, you have uh, experimental workers, uh, these uh, worker threads where you can just put off the heavy computations there and just forget about it. So, yeah, that's exactly what we can do. And, I mean, it's fine. So it's not so trivial, but uh, it works and it's really easy to, like, uh, run into this issue because JVM libraries see no issues in blocking the calling thread because it's just a different uh, different model and it's not so not so great with Node.js. 
So for our second use case, what we'll be trying to do is we'll be trying to consume messages from RabbitMQ. And uh, we want to use the RabbitMQ push API, not the pull API where you just ask for messages, just so that, because it's like much easier to write code like this, where well, you say just, well, when a message arrives, call this function and call it a day. So, how, do we, how can we do that? First of all, we need to figure out how to do callbacks with Growl. Uh, then we'll define a wrapper for the Rabbit, oh, of course, I forgot to mention, we'll be using the Rabbit, uh, the Java RabbitMQ client. Uh, there's a perfectly fine Node.js uh, client, but we'll just ignore that for now. Um, so yeah, we'll define a wrapper, a Java wrapper API just to simplify the details. Uh, then we'll implement a callback for a handler in Node. And finally, we'll handle a RabbitMQ message in Node. So, uh, how do we do callbacks with Growl? It actually turns out it's really, really simple. Uh, so yeah, the first two lines here just create a, an array list that contains uh, a Java array list that contains elements one and two, and then we can just convert it into a stream. So like, it's, it looks pretty much the same. Like the bottom part looks exactly the same as, uh, well, not exactly the same, but very similar to what you would do with, with Java if you just replaced, you know, some cosmetic details. But the nice thing is we just give it a Java, like we just give it a JavaScript function the, for example, map method, and it just works. And we can also refer to methods on objects. So in the for each, we're actually referring to the log method on the console object from JavaScript, which is actually, you know, there's a, when you think about it, there's quite a lot of things going on in this example, because there's also uh, variadic arguments for the example for the erases list. So it's, it's pretty cool, actually. Um, yeah, and if we run it, we get we would get in node one and two. So, now let's define an API for like a message queue abstraction. So it will just have pretty much two methods. Well, first of all, to initialize, so like to connect to the broker and then we can register consumers. So we provide the queue name that you want, we want to listen on and the handler uh, to handle the messages. And the, the handler just has one message, uh, one method, which is handle, and it gets the contents of the message converted into a string. So how that would look in JavaScript? Well, we need, again, a reference to the RabbitMQ class. We initialize it, and then we define handle to be console log. So it's just a function, and we can just add the consumer to the hello rabbit Q and that should work, right? So let's let's see how that works. So um, let's start our example. I'm really sorry that it's taking so long to start up, but because it's actually it's <laughs> starting up the JVM twice because npm also starts the JVM just so it can call another process. So we see that the handler was registered, and now we can actually try posting a message to it. So it's just, uh, let's just try to do that. And we try to do that, and instead of the message being print printed, we get a nice stack trace, and like, I mean, if you're using Node, you haven't seen a stack trace like this in a while, because it's like, well, I mean, it's not too big for Java standards, but it's still quite a bit. And the message we get, it's multi-thread access requested by thread, but is not allowed for language in JavaScript. And, uh, well, what does that mean? And uh, when I think about it, it makes sense because JavaScript has no concept of like multi-threading. It has no synchronization primitives, no, like I mean, all hell would break loose if you just like mutated uh, an object while JavaScript was iterating over it like from a different thread. It would be like, you can't even think about these things because they're not defined in the language. So we can't directly call uh, JavaScript code from another Java thread. We can do it synchronously, so if, if we're like calling a, a, a Java method, we give it a JavaScript function and it calls it immediately and returns control back, that's fine. But if we do it asynchronously, it's not, it doesn't work. 
So we would actually really want to be able to do that. So we'll try to conjure up a function uh, that I call bind callback, which would actually allow us to wrap a JavaScript function so that it can later on be executed by Java from a different thread asynchronously. So unfortunately, Growl.js does not provide that out of the box, but let's just see what we can do about that. And uh, so this is going to be <laughs> a bit intense, so just bear with me. So we have uh, several things here. Uh, first of all, we have the node, main Node.js process in the top, top and top right part. So that's where we, we get our function that we want to call. Then we have the Java land in the bottom. So when we were talking about, well, seamless interop, this doesn't exactly look like seamless interop because there's seams there. Uh, and uh, we have this interop busting, just, well, let's just see how that, all that works. So what we want to do, we want to call this uh, function uh, represented by the purple triangle with asynchronous results from Java. So what we can do is we can give this function to the interop bus, which will then give us back another function that, is ra that wraps this uh, function without actually calling it. It just has a pointer to it. So then the JavaScript can give this wrapped function to, to a synchronous Java code, and the synchronous Java code can now actually call this function, uh, but it's still an asynchronous function, and since it's an asynchronous function, it actually returns a promise that we also put into this tongue or whatever, like this data structure. So now we have this data structure that contains the function, the JavaScript function we want to call, the arguments that it, uh, this function was called with, and the promise that should be completed or rejected when uh, the other side actually gets to run, uh, to run the callback. So when you execute this function, what it actually does, instead of directly executing the JavaScript code, it puts it into a queue. Uh, so then there's a Node.js worker that pulls this queue and, uh, well, actually blocks on this queue. Uh, and uh, when um, uh, this thunk is put into the queue, the node worker gets the thunk, uh, then using the post message API, posts it back to the main process, and th now the main process can actually take the structure and take the, uh, get the function that it should have called, uh, call it with uh, whatever arguments were provided previously, and based on these results, uh, uh, either complete or reject or ignore the promise. The reason we need that promise thing, if we wanted to properly implement a, a message handler in JavaScript, we would probably need, well, I mean, we wouldn't be blocking on the JavaScript part either, so we need some way to indicate that the message was either handled uh, successfully or it failed. I mean, you could of course do it differently, but this is just a basic pattern of how you would do that. So with this, uh, and I mean, this is not the only way that you could do it, but like the, the concept is still pretty much the same. You could implement it as a uh, well, execution context, sort of where you tell uh, that this code should run on the JavaScript thread, uh, but we won't get into that too much. But still, you have this same concept where you have to have a queue of like pending uh, callbacks you want to call, and this worker that takes it from that queue and then propagates it to the main process. Uh, so now that we have that, we can actually implement handlers that can be called from a different thread. Uh, and the way, unfortunately, at this point, we can't rely, previously we had this really nice, uh, well, magic happening where you just wanted th this handler interface, but we just gave it the JavaScript function and it automatically worked somehow. Uh, now we also need another Java class to actually implement the interface because if it's the, the binding happens automatically, it gets, it's JavaScript still, so you can't call that from another thread either. So now we need this wrapper class, which just delegates to the callback. And uh, 
so in our code, what we would need to do, is we would need to require the bind callback function from our, uh, by the way, all the co code examples will be, are available on GitHub. There will be a link at the end uh, where you can get it. So yeah, uh, here what we need to do is we need to take the function we want to call, we need to bind it's into a callback, which can be ex executed from a different thread, and then we also need to, to wrap it in this JS handler that's just so it matches the interface that is requ required for the at consumer uh, method. So let's see how that looks. So this obviously didn't work. Will the other thing work? So we try. We try again. It still takes a while. Yeah, and now it's uh, listening. We see that it's, yeah, it's a, a bit bigger uh, handler. When, when it's two string, it's a bit bigger. And we see that it's a JS handler that contain a, contains a bound JS callback, which contains the JavaScript function. So now, if we actually post it, we actually get the message delivered, which is, uh, which is exactly what we wanted, but uh, yeah, we wanted it probably a bit sooner and a bit easier. So, the async part is, uh, well, it, it works, sort of. Uh, if, you're, if you wanna actually do this in production, you have to manage the depending queue size, like I mean it can't be unbounded because you'll run out of memory and everything will crash. And it's like really not trivial to make it probably really production worthy and uh, correct because there's also a bunch of other issues you have to worry about like un uh, tracking how many bound callbacks are, are there so that your process doesn't exit too early and there's just a bunch of stuff. So. What are the conclusions here? So yeah, one issue that I didn't really focus on, but I think it's really important, it's that you have conflicting dependency management models. So yeah, it's packaging, it, it, it's not fun there because like you can't use either NPM or Maven because neither of those work for the other. So it's, you probably would have to do some, something like that, Bazel or something like that. Uh, then, most JVM libraries, even though you do have interop, you still need wrappers to deal with blocking and asynchrony, and you still need uh, infrastructure to make sure that you don't block the event loop because it's easy, easy, really easy to do that. And last, lastly, uh, Graal Node.js, the binary that's shipped, it's actually Node 10, I think, is not exactly a 100% drop in replacement for Node.js, as uh, the Ukrainian guides find out, found out. Uh, and yeah, so the call to action here would be probably if you're interested in this sort of stuff, because it, it is interesting, like uh, maybe not you know, necessarily moving all our Node services to GraalVM, but uh, it definitely it definitely achieves quite a bit on its promises, it's just that it's not quite as straightforward as you would think initially. And uh, another thing I need to definitely mention is the credits and the other people who uh, took part in this research, because this is not only my research, so that's uh, Pius Navitskas and Milda Glebovskaita from the Lithuania office, and uh, Gleb Alexeyev and Viktor Polishchuk from Ukraine. So, thank you.